Doors. It's my honor to introduce two uh, outstanding individuals on the stage for our session on constitutional history and interpretation. Our first presentation will be given by Philip Munoz, who is Associate Professor of Political Science and concurrent Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame, where he directs the Potenziani Program in Constitutional Studies and the Tocqueville Program for Inquiry into Religion and Public Life. Professor Munoz writes and teaches across the fields of political philosophy, constitutional law, and American politics. His first book, God and the Founders, Madison, Washington, and Jefferson, published by Cambridge University Press, won the Hubert Morkin Award from the American Political Science Association for the best publication on religion and politics in 2009 and 2010. His presentation today is titled, Two Concepts of Religious Liberty. Professor Munoz is joined by David Sahat, Associate Professor of History at Georgia State University. Professor Sahat writes and teaches broadly on American political and cultural life. His first book, The Myth of American Religious Freedom, won the Frederick Jackson Turner Award from the Organization of American Historians. He is also the author of The Jefferson Rule, How the Founding Fathers Became Infallible and Our Politics Inflexible, published by Simon & Schuster. For the 2017-2018 academic term, David has been named the John G. Winant Visiting Professor of American Government at Oxford University. Please help me in welcoming our first presenter, Philip. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for uh, sticking around. Uh, I was just telling David, this is the time uh, at a usual conference where I go take a nap. <laughs> Feel free if uh, the spirit moves you. Uh, I, I'm extremely pleased to be a participant in this summer. Um, this last semester, I, I developed a new course at Notre Dame on constitutional government and public policy. Uh, and I designed the course uh, intentionally uh, to cover only contentious political topics. Basically, I, I sat around and thought, what are, what are the things that make students most mad at each other? Uh, abortion, gay marriage, free speech, income inequality, immigration, uh, pornography, the death penalty. Um, uh, those pro those pornography and the death penalty, there's the most consensus on in, in the class. Um, the kids liked one and not the other. <laughs> Uh, and the reason I developed this course was um, I think it's critically important that our, our students who disagree with one another talk to one another. Um, our liberal students have got to read our conserv or have got to read good conservative arguments, and conservative ar uh, students have to read good liberal arguments. Uh, and then they need to talk to one another. And increasingly, this is not happening on universities, and it's it's not good, right? I mean, democracy produces disagreement, uh, and we have to figure out a way to work through these disagreements if we want to have a, a well-functioning uh, democracy. Uh, so I, I mentioned that course because uh, when I received this invitation, I thought, oh, they're trying to do the exact same thing that, that we're trying to do, at least that my program's trying to do at Notre Dame. So I, I applaud Gleaves and, and Scott, and especially the benefactors who have gone behind this initiative. Uh, whatever our, our disagreements, that we're here talking to one another, uh, that you're still here listening to us talk to one another is critically important. And it's, it really is an honor and a, and a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. Uh, and I, I should also mention, I couldn't be more pleased to um, uh, share the stage with David Sihat. He's, um, I say that even though I know he's gonna criticize everything I'm about to say. Uh, David is uh, an uncommonly bright uh, and talented young historian. Uh, exactly the type of type of scholar that is most uh, it's most enjoyable to be on the stage with. So, David, thank you very much for for being here as well. I'm going to try to convey um, one very simple point: uh, that when we think about religious liberty, uh, we should uh, take the founders seriously, um, especially in matters of law uh, and, and politics. Uh, the Founding Fathers have something to teach us. Uh, I don't say that we should simply defer to the Founding Fathers. Uh, even if we wanted to, I think that would be difficult to do. And I don't say we should take the Founders seriously because they wrote the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, so that's important. I don't say we should take them seriously 
because uh, I want to uh, limit judicial discretion, though I do, we should take the founders seriously uh, on matters of religious liberty because they thought more profoundly, more philosophically, and even more intelligently than we do today. I think we should take the Founding Fathers seriously because they can teach us something very important that we have forgotten. That's a bold argument, I think, one that uh, most historians and political scientists would disagree with. Uh, and what I'm gonna try to do in really about 20 minutes is try to back up, back up that claim. Uh, to do so, I'm going to start with uh, the modern approach. Uh, and this modern approach I see share, is actually shared by liberals and conservatives. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about my understanding, my interpretation of the founder's approach. And then you'll see my argument lies in comparing the two. Uh, and if I do my job well, uh, after, after I uh, set forth the, the modern approach and then set forth the founder's approach, I think you'll see why I think uh, the, con the, the founders have something uh, to teach us. I, I'm going to start uh, with the modern approach, but a little bit of background information before I, I do so. We have to make a clarification bet between what I call indirect burdens on religious freedom and direct burdens. And this occurs within the larger rubric of uh, what generally goes on uh, under the First Amendment as a free exercise of religion. So direct burdens and indirect burden. A direct burden on religion is when a law or regulation targets religion directly. An indirect burden, as, as you can probably figure out, is when, when a more generally applicable law has a, the incidental effect of burdening a religious practice or religious citizens. So a, a law that explicitly prohibited uh, Catholics from going to confession uh, would be a direct burden on religion. A regulation that requires all large employers, including Catholic hospitals or Catholic universities, to, pr to provide free contraception or abortifacients, right? That doesn't target Catholics as such. They're just, uh, they, they might not like that law. Catholic University, I use I mean, Notre Dame, obviously didn't like that law. Uh, but that would be an example of what I'm calling an indirect burden. I can illustrate these a little bit better with recourse to a few uh, Supreme Court examples. Um, the classic indirect burden case was uh, in the early 1970s, a um, case called Yoder. Uh, this was a Wisconsin law, the case, uh, a Supreme Court decision. It involved a Wisconsin law that required uh, mandatory school attendance for all children uh, till the age of 16. Uh, Amish parents typically withdrew their, their children from the, from the school system uh, after the eighth grade, so around ages 13 or 14. And the superintendent of public schools in Wisconsin one year started fining these Amish parents every day their, their school-aged children were, were uh, in violation of the law. That is, every day their, their kids were not in school. So the Amish sued under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, and the Amish ultimately prevailed. Um, what concerns us here is not the, the details of that case, but the general approach the, the Supreme Court used. And this is how I'm going to illustrate what I call the modern approach. Uh, when the court ad, uh, adjudicates uh, these uh, indirect burden cases, they ask a series of threshold questions and then they conduct a balancing test, right? So to, to have your free exercise of religion burdened, you have to be a sincere religious believer and the, then the, the court has to recognize that your religious exercises in some way have been burdened and usually they say burdened in a substantial way. Assuming that you pass the threshold questions, there's a two-part balancing test. Uh, the court asks, uh, is the state pursuing a compelling state interest? That's a legal term of, term of art, a compelling state interest. And if the state is pursuing a compelling state interest, uh, are, is the state using the least restrictive means, that is, least restrictive on religious exercise, um, the least restrictive means possible? If, if the state fails to pass these two balancing prongs, either of them, uh, either one or the other, that is, if the state is not pursuing a compelling state interest in the eyes of a court, or if the state is pursuing a compelling state interest but not using narrowly tailored means, then the religious litigant gets an exemption from the law. That's why I call it the, an, an exemptionist balancing analysis. This is how the Supreme Court uh, uh, used to adjudicate the free exercise clause. There's a change in, in the court's doctrine on that. But then this, this test was ba effectively reintroduced to the court system via uh, a federal legislation, the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's also been, uh, many RIFRAs or state level RIFRAs have been passed uh, at the state level as well. If you remember in my state of Indiana, um, oh gosh, I guess this is uh, 
two years ago when Mike Pence was governor, there was a big controversy. That was when the state of Indiana was trying to pass a RIFRA law that would have uh, required Indiana judges to do this exact exemptionist balancing, balancing test. Okay, that's how the courts uh, tend to adjudicate uh, indirect burdens. What about uh, direct burdens? Let me again give you another case. This is a 1993 case called Church of the Lukumi Babalu I. Um, this is one of those cases you couldn't make up the, the facts if you, if you tried. Uh, the case uh, uh, was brought to the Supreme Court by practitioners of the Santeria religion. Um, Santeria is an Afro-American religion of Cuban origin. Uh, in th this town, uh, there's a town outside of Miami, the city of Hialeah. They basically, the city council basically tried to outlaw the practice of Santeria through a series, an evolving series of city ordinances. Um, the, the city council and really the population of the city, they didn't like uh, Santeria. Uh, it's a mixture of Catholicism and voodooism, and it includes a ritual, ritualistic sacrifice of animals. Um, and lots of people didn't like that. It also, now for reasons I don't quite understand, uh, as, as it was practiced uh, in this town, it involved the public disposal of these animals that had been sacrificed. Uh, so literally, you know, goat carcasses would be placed on the sidewalks every Tuesday morning. Um, the city didn't like it, and they, they uh, passed, they actually had a hard time figuring out how to pass, they couldn't just ban Santeria, they knew that, so they passed these ordinances that were clearly targeting Santeria. Uh, you know, they outlawed ritualistic animal sacrifice, not for consumption, and, and it was clearly aimed at the Santeria religion. Okay, so that would be an example of a direct burden case. When the Supreme Court heard this case in 1993, they struck the city ordinances down nine to zero in an opinion by Justice Kennedy. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote, and this is sort of the key sentence of the, of the opinion, if the, if the object of a law is to infringe upon or restrict religious practices because of their religious motivation, the law is not neutral. That is, it directly burdens religion. And it's therefore invalid unless it's justified by compelling state interest uh, and is narrowly tailored uh, to advance that interest. So you see here the balancing. Basically, they, what the court did in this direct burden case is they took the, their indirect burden analysis and they mapped on the direct burden, I'm sorry, the compelling state interest balancing part of the test to adjudicate um, uh, direct burden cases. I mentioned compelling state interest. That, uh, that again, the lawyers in the room will know that's a, a legal term of art. I mean, and that... It's not exactly precise, but it means the interest has to be of the most important type, right? That uh, something that the government is, is um, compelled to do, uh, as it were. Okay, so the Santeria group won this case nine to zero, and so the case is usually taken to be, uh, understood to be a resounding victory for religious liberty. Um, the more I thought about this case, uh, the more I think that's, that's wrong. Um, and the argument I'm going to make t in the next 10 minutes or so is that uh, this case, this 9-0 victory for the Santeria group, actually could be the precedent that destroys religious liberty in America. Uh, as, as far as I know, no scholar agrees with me. <laughs> and this is the first time I've presented this lecture. So you, you have to tell me if I, if I make the case well. Okay. To make my argument, I'm going to turn to to the founders. Uh, and to do that, I need to, before I go to the founders, I need to introduce a, a, a caveat or two. Um, the first caveat is really that the, the founders, I have to acknowledge the founders disagreed uh, among a great many things regarding religion. Um, I, know, I know Dave is gonna talk about this, or I, I presume he is, because I know his work. Uh, and I agree with, uh, actually we agree on a lot of things, uh, especially about how the founders disagreed. My first book, which was mentioned, it, it's on Jefferson, Madison, and Washington. And what I do is I show how they disagreed on these church state matters, all sorts of church state matters. Uh, but the more I've thought about the founders and the better I think I've understood them, I've come to see that in one key and crucial element, and it's actually the, what I, I've come to believe, the most important element, uh, the founders uh, agree on the deep and underlying principle uh, uh, they agree on a deep and underlying principle about religious freedom. Um, and and that, the, that principle is language we understand or we, we hear and it's familiar to us, but I don't think we quite understand. And that is they believe that all individuals possess an inalienable natural right to religious free exercise. Okay, it's actually relatively easy to document that the founders 
uh, agreed on this underlying principle. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm a, a bit nervous about doing this next section because this, this room is full of historians and uh, you know, I'm a political scientist. When my political science colleagues want to insult me, they call me a historian. Uh, but I'm not really a historian, so. Um, there's, there's a set of documents uh, from the founding era that are little studied, but in some ways the most important documents of the era. Uh, and these are the state constitutions drafted between uh, June 1776 and um, 1784. Uh, and the story behind them is when before, even before the Declaration of Independence was written, um, the, I guess it was the Continental Congress told the states, look, we're about to break from England. You should write constitutions. Each state should write a constitution. And these constitutions are magnificent. And many of the states, not all of them, but eight out of the first 14 states, uh, seven out of the 13 original states, and then Vermont, who actually wrote a constitution in 1777, uh, but doesn't become a state till later. Uh, eight of these states write what are called declarations of rights. And the, the declarations of rights are actually separate from the state constitutions. I mean, usually they're, uh, sometimes they're adopted on different days, but usually the declarations of rights preface the state constitutions. And these declarations of rights are uh, statements of pr the principles of the founders' understanding of government. They're an incredibly rich source of information and what's fascinating is when you turn to them, they all basically say the same thing about religious liberty. Okay, Just a few. I mentioned there are eight declarations of rights. I just I wanted to fit it all on one slide. So I've given you the text from four of them. Three of them, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Vermont, actually uh, had the same text. I, th I think Delaware was the first one. And I'm not sure if Pennsylvania and Vermont just copied Delaware's. Uh, so I gave you some early ones. And then I give you New Hampshire, which is, which is the last one. Right. And you can see that language of uh, natural and inalienable rights. Okay, so all, these, all the states basically say the same thing, that individuals have a natural and unalienable right to worship God according to conscience. Now, what does that mean? Right? A language that's familiar to us, but what did they mean when they said that? And I think to understand what they mean, we have to go back and, and uh, this is, you know, this is Civics 101. Many of you will remember this from your introduction to American um, government class in college, or probably if you're uh, of an older generation, you learned this in high school. We, we have to recall the um, social compact theory of the founders. And what I've given you is the first four articles of the New, the New Hampshire Declaration of Rights. I could have used any of the states uh, to illustrate this, but New Hampshire is the last one, and, my hunch is that, in some ways, it's the clearest one because they, they went last. There are um, three basic building blocks, or three basic steps in the founder's social compact theory. And when I say social compact theory, I mean just, this is the founder's philosophy of government. Um, the starting point for the founders, and again, this too is in every state declaration of rights. The starting point really for all American political thought, I know this is going to be contentious, but uh, is the natural equality of all individuals. We are all equal insofar as we are equal in our natural liberty. What does that mean? That no individual by nature has rightful authority to rule any other individual without his consent. By nature, we all equally possess self-dominion over ourselves and over our labor. Right? Uh, we usually summarize, and the founders summarize by saying, we're all equal in our natural rights. Now, uh, uh, let me just anticipate uh, uh, an objection that's really not germane to this conversation, but several of you are probably thinking of it. Well, what about slavery? Well, of course, right? Slavery is, I mean, this language of equal natural rights made slavery a problem, right? Because we believe in natural rights, that is, the Americans believed in natural rights, slavery was a problem. Does that mean the founders were hypocrites? Certainly some of them were, without a doubt. Right? They, they said one thing and they believed one thing and they acted in a different way. Right? That's what I mean by slavery becomes a problem because of this philosophy. We can talk about more th about that if you want, but it's really not germane. But they all agree on this idea, first, equal natural rights. Okay? Second point of the founder's social compact theory, government is instituted to protect rights, in particular natural rights. 
right? To protect our rights, free and independent individuals enter into society with one another and form a government to uh, form a government, make a constitution to govern themselves. Right? When we form this government, right, individuals turn over or they alienate, that is, they entrust authority to the government to protect their rights, to safeguard their rights, to enforce their rights. So legitimate government arises via consent, right? And the primary purpose of government is to protect our rights. Right? I could also, I mean, this is also is the same as the Declaration of Independence, okay? So we, first point is equality, natural human equality, which means our natural equal liberty. Second point is we create government to protect our rights. The third point, right? So what we've covered, that's Article 1, 2, and 3. The third point, actually Article 4 here, some rights are inalienable. Right. What does that mean? There are some, a, a few certain things, few, a few certain natural rights that we do not give authority over to government. So even when we form a government, even when we enter into a social compact, we retain our sovereignty over those inalienable natural rights. Think about the language. We do not alienate, that is, we do not turn authority over to government. That's, so inalienable is a technical term. The way we talk, use it today, just we, I mean, it's really, really important. But the founders used that term precisely, right? We retain jurisdiction over certain inalienable rights. The most obvious example is the right to revolution. Right? You, you couldn't turn over the right to revolution to the government. Right? You know, so the government tells you when you would revolt. I mean, only a millennial would think that. <laughs> I, I use that in class and my students don't get it. <laughs> okay. So what does this mean that we have this? So religious liberty is also an inalienable right. Look at four, right? And it's the first right they list, right? Among these natural rights, some are in their very nature unalienable, right? Because no equivalent can be given or received for them. Of this kind are the rights of conscience. That's, the founders all agreed with that. That's the principle they uniformly accepted. Okay, well, what does that mean? Sorry. Article five of the New Hampshire Declaration of Rights, right? What it means, what the inalienable rights of conscience means, right, is that government may not hurt, molest, or restrain a person for exercising their religion according to conscience. The reason why government cannot hurt, molest, or restrain a person according to religious worship is that religious worship as such is beyond the jurisdiction of government. Government has no right to regulate or outlaw or any way control the right, the exercise of religious liberty. Look at the language that Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Vermont use, right? It's the language of jurisdiction. Government has no business in the business of religion. So the founders' teaching about religious liberty is actually, their core teaching is actually quite simple. And this is my summary of it. I think I'm going backwards here. Right. Government has no authority, again, this is my summary. Government has no authority to penalize or regulate religious exercises as such because religious free exercise is an inalienable natural right. We the people do not grant government power to infringe upon our religious practices as such, religious practices as religious practices on account, or on account of our religious motivation. Government may not impose direct burdens on religious exercises as such. That is the founders' teaching uh, in three sentences. Only took me 12 years to figure that out. This is Justice Kennedy's articulation in the Supreme Court, 9-0 decision. Justice Kennedy's articulation of religious liberty. Do you see the difference? In 1993, under the guise of protecting religious freedom, in the 9-0 decision, 9-0 decisions are always the most dangerous ones. Under the guise of protecting religious freedom, the Supreme Court actually articulated 
the very rationale by which government may legitimately outlaw religious practices undertaken for religious reasons. Right? Look at Justice Kennedy's sentence again. If the object of a law is to infringe upon or restrict religious practices because of their religious motivation, what is he saying there? If a government, if a state government, or the federal government for that matter, or a city council, wants to outlaw religious practice because it's religious, the law is not neutral. And therefore, when can the state do this? If they have a compelling state interest to do so, and they do so in a narrowly tailored way. The founders would have said, that is a break from our constitutional tradition. That is a repudiation of the idea of inalienable natural rights. It's a repudiation of limited government. Usually we, we, when we talk about, or especially when conservatives talk about limited government, we assume that means small government. But small government's different from limited government. Limited government means there are some things government cannot do and can never have a compelling state interest to do. And the first limit on government was on regarding religion. Government has no authority over religious exercises. That was central to the idea, the, the idea of the founders' natural rights republicanism, that there are some things government legitimately may not do. Right? That's why they called religious worship an unalienable natural right. The Supreme Court, I'm not even sure if they know that they've done so, but the Supreme Court has rejected this view. Under the contemporary Supreme Court jurisprudence, government in principle can do anything. Government can restrict religious practices, even religious practices done for religious reasons, if the state has a compelling state interest to do so, and they do so in a precisely calibrated manner. If I'm right, and believe me, I hope I'm wrong, but if I'm right, we've undergone a revolution in our understanding of the right to religious freedom. Not only that, a, a revolution in our understanding of the authority of government. We used to understand the purposes of government. The primary purpose of government was to protect our rights. First and foremost, our natural rights. Right? That's step two in the founder's social compact theory. Under the new understanding articulated by the Supreme Court, the purpose of government is to regulate rights, to prefer some, and to limit others in light of compelling state interests. I don't think we've experienced the full impact of this revolution, though I think we can see how it's starting to corrupt more and more of our public and private life. Uh, think about the willingness to limit free speech, another fundamental freedom, right? You see this on college campuses more and more, right? Uh, no one ever says, well, I just want to limit free speech for the sake of limiting free speech. It's always, we need to limit this, I'm in favor of free speech, unless there's a more compelling interest we have right, in promoting diversity or inclusion or whatever. It's the same rationale. Before we experience this, the full impact of this revolution and the corresponding loss of freedom it will necessarily entail, I hope we'll think about returning to the natural rights principles of the American founding to do that, we must first to learn to take our founders' political thought seriously. And I hope my presentation today has made at least a first step in doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all for making it to the very end before, I guess before drinks, so um, I apologize. I'm standing between you and drinks, but um, thank you for being here. Thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you to Professor Munoz for that uh, very nice provocation. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about originalism, and I'm really happy that we're talking about originalism using this issue, because I think that originalism is a really important topic, particularly after the Neil Gorsuch nomination, and yet uh, in a lot of the debate about originalism surrounding that nomination, there was a kind of a problem, it seemed to me, a lot of the criticisms and then a lot of the uh, affirmations of originalism really missed the mark, partly because of the difficulty of talking about originalism in the abstract. Originalism's problems really don't snap into focus until you focus on particular 
issues. And the issue of religious freedom is actually one of the most useful ways of talking about both the problems and the perils of originalism. And that's because both conservatives and liberals make originalist arguments when it comes to religious freedom. Conservatives tend to say that the founding fathers did not advocate the separation of church and state, that they allowed the state to make various accommodations for religion, and in fact they allowed a certain interpenetration of religion in uh, the public square. Liberals, of course, often argue that the Founding Fathers, through the First Amendment, separated church and state, both of which are basically originalist arguments. And each of these arguments, I would say, commit a series of fallacies uh, that structure our political conversation about religion in the public square, and I'd like to go through those fallacies with you in this talk. Uh, the first fallacy, which may or may not be assumed in this session, but is uh, certainly assumed in American political debate, and is sometimes assumed in American scholarly debate, uh, is that the founders had a singular view of religion. And I'm going to call this the fallacy of unanimity. You hear a lot uh, people say something like, the founding fathers thought, fill in the blank. And the problem is, is that there is very little you can actually fill in that blank with that makes any sense. And that's especially true when it comes to religion. The founders had various views of religion, though many of them were a somewhat enlightened sort. Let's start with Benjamin Franklin. In 1790, the Congregationalist minister, Ezra Stiles, uh, uh, see, I almost always say emailed Franklin, and that's, uh, that's a problem, uh, wrote Franklin a letter to ask him about his religious opinions, and, uh, and in particular, what he thought of Jesus of Nazareth. Franklin, at this point, was pretty old, pretty sick. He was about to die in five months. And so he wrote Ezra Stiles back, and he gave Stiles his credo. He said this, I believe in one God, creator of the universe, that he governs it by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service we can render to him is doing good to his other children, that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life, respecting its conduct in this. With the exception of the immortality of the soul, something that he doubted early on and then sort of came back to later in life, his credo was entirely a religion of this world. Uh, he thought the best way to honor God was basically to treat other people well. Thomas Jefferson was much more circumspect. In 1801, shortly after he became president, a minister wrote to Jefferson asking him about his religious opinions. Jefferson responded to say that he had ceased to read or to think about what he called the country of spirits. He had concerned himself with that issue when he was younger, but in his maturity he had decided, in his words, to lay his head on that pillow of ignorance which a benevolent creator has made so soft. And uh, you can see just why Jefferson is a genius in writing right there. Um, it's really difficult, though, to say much more than that. He famously, of, co of course, produced the Jefferson Bible, where he took the New Testament, cut out all the miraculous parts, and then pasted it back together. So I think it's fair to say that he had an enlightened skepticism about uh, miracles. Um, but he left no diaries to which he confessed his innermost thoughts. He said almost nothing about the subject in his correspondence. The one thing that we could say with certainty is that he believed that religion was a private affair, and to the extent that he believed anything at all, he kept it pretty much private. John Adams was the opposite. He was a Congregationalist turned Unitarian who believed in the social utility of the Christian religion. He had a deep, deep, deep suspicion of Catholicism, deep suspicion of Catholicism. He believed in 1780, in his words, that, this is a direct quote, reason, morality, and the Christian religion without the monkery of priests or the knavery of politicians, there you see the anti-Catholicism right there, uh, characterized the feeling of the United States and of Massachusetts in particular. Late in his life, during the Second Great Awakening, which involved the massive expansion of evangelical religion, which he viewed with considerable dismay, uh, he wrote Jefferson a letter mocking the American Bible Society and other evangelical institutions. He wanted Jefferson to understand that although he detested evangelicalism, and although he viewed the American Bible Society as a purveyor of corrupt Christianity, he still nevertheless thought of himself as a Christian. But his religion by this late stage of his life was a pretty minimal affair. He told Jefferson, the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount contain my religion. 
Now, I could go on. We could discuss each founder turn by turn, and they would, in many cases, disagree with one another. They would also disagree with themselves at various parts in time, their own previous beliefs, and uh, that would be a, a, a problem because we cannot then say what they thought as a group their religious sentiments were. But added to that fallacy of unanimity is a second fallacy that we might call the fallacy of definition. It turns on this question. Who gets to be a founder that counts for the purposes of this discussion? There are, you might say, first-tier founders and second-tier founders and third-tier founders and probably even fifth and sixth and seventh-tier founders. The Harvard historian and New Yorker essayist Jill Lepore has spoken of, in her words, the comic book version of history that serves as our national heritage, where the founding fathers are like the Hanna-Barbera super friends. In that history, it's obvious. Washington is Superman. Jefferson is Batman, and then by the time you get to like Thomas Paine or Patrick Henry, you're at the level of Aquaman or somebody like that. And that's a, that's a good story, it's a good story, but it's problematic if we're trying to find out the founders' views on something, because there's a whole bunch of people that don't even rise to the level of Aquaman that ne nevertheless had a very shaping influence on American political debate. So, so how do we get beyond this? You may remember that in 1860, Abraham Lincoln actually confronted this issue quite directly in his Cooper Union Address. At this point, just prior to the American Civil War, American politicians were engaging in an extended debate, both of which, uh, both, all sides of which, were trying to appropriate the founders to justify their own position on slavery and its expansion. They would often cite the founders selectively, tendentiously, and use that one founder or that one quote of the founder to speak for the whole. And Lincoln thought that that was problematic, so he decided to use this Cooper Union Address to provide some rigor to the discussion. He started the address then in a kind of odd way. He pointed out that, okay, we're having this debate, and we need to really define our terms. He made this kind of lawyerly move, and he said, all right, so let's consider what we mean by the founders and take it in its most limited sense. That is, the people who drafted and signed the U.S. Constitution. Uh, because, of course, the reason that we care about the founders is the U.S. constitutional tradition. So he counted up the 39 or so people who drafted the Constitution, identified where they fell on slavery and its spread, and said, hey, see, they agree with me. But because he was a careful thinker, he realized, you know, that was a little problematic, too, because to count up the constitutional framers leaves out people like John Adams, who was not at the Constitutional Convention. He was the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain. He didn't have any hand in drafting it. And on some fundamental level, he never really got what the Constitution was about. It also leaves out people like Thomas Jefferson, who was the U.S. ambassador to France, who also did not have a hand in drafting the Constitution and who didn't like the Constitution when he first read it. So what Lincoln said was, all right, well, uh, th that's problematic too, but you'd actually have to leave out even more than that. You'd have to leave out people who opposed the ratification of the Constitution, but who took part in drafting it. This is people like uh, James Monroe, the nation's fifth president, who is unquestionably a founder. Now, in his Cooper Union speech, Lincoln then broadened the idea to anyone who uh, took part in the first Congress and therefore drafted the Bill of Rights. Now, again, that would still leave out Adams and Jefferson because they didn't draft the Bill of Rights since they were in the executive. Uh, so then he started sort of casting wider and wider and wider, trying to figure this out. And what he arrived at was something like a, a very broad definition of, 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 of the founders. It, it's, it's everyone who drafted the U.S. Constitution, who served in the first Washington administration, who signed the Declaration of Independence, who served in some capacity in the first presidential administration, and who served in the first one or two iterations of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, we're dealing with a lot of people here. You can see the, the problem. And, uh, you know, they didn't really have all the same opinion on things. Some supported the Constitution, some did not. Some supported amendments, some did not. Some supported some amendments, but not others. And some disagreed with them on that. And most relevant to our discussion, and getting back to our discussion, many of them had vastly different views on religion and its place in the public square. And if we really wanted to be rigorous, we would have to add in all the delegates to the state ratification conventions, which is arguably the most uh, uh, important part of the entire constitutional process. But again, do we really expect that all those people had the same view on American religion? 
That brings to me to my third problem, or to stick with my original language, my third fallacy. The founders' views on religion, though you often hear about that in popular discourse and in some scholarly debates, that's not really the real issue. The real issue, more precisely, is their view on the relationship of religion to politics and their view on the relationship of religion to American constitutional governance. But here again, we come to a problem of disagreement. Jefferson supported a fairly complete separation of church and state and a kind of state neutrality concerning religion. In his famous 1779 Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia, he wrote, and this is all a quote, the opinions of men are not the object of civil government, nor under its jurisdiction. In the most important clause of that bill, Jefferson rejected, just as Professor Munoz has said, the government's regulation of religion entirely. It read like this. Because our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions, all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinion in matters of religion, and the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. In his notes on the state of Virginia, his one book, he famously wrote, it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Madison believed much the same. Adams, by contrast, believed that the Christian religion had social utility, and he supported the Massachusetts arrangement, which was the arrangement in six states, that states were paid, out of, or, uh, sorry, churches were paid out of the public treasury. But now we have a fourth fallacy, and they're kind of piling up now. This fourth fallacy is the idea that the founders' thought, or individual founders' thoughts, can be taken as representative of the era. I can point to a shelf load of books, including one by my counterpart who takes three of the founders' thoughts, that takes the individual's views of select founders as though they are individually important. But of course, the founders did not always get what we wanted, even, we can, even what they wanted, even if we can say precisely what it is that they wanted. Although Jefferson believed, as I just said, that, quote, the opinions of men are not the object of civil government, nor under its jurisdiction, his fellow legislators actually disagreed with that. And they stripped that out of the final version of the bill. To take that as Jefferson's opinion, which it unquestionably was, to assume that that opinion then represented the Virginia legislators is wrong, because that didn't make it actually into the final bill. Uh, similarly, in 1776, although Benjamin Franklin was an important figure in drafting the Pennsylvania Constitution, he had to accept his fellow legislators' decision to require all office holders to swear the following oath. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of good and the punisher of the wicked. And I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. When Benjamin Rush, a moderate Presbyterian with Unitarian leanings, wrote to Franklin complaining basically about this religious test for office, Franklin responded to say he simply lost the vote. The point is that understanding the founders in isolation, even if we rightly focus on their uh, understanding or views about the role of religion in American governance, uh, doesn't really tell us much. A better approach is to look at the actual legal and political arrangements concerning religion, and there something much clearer comes into focus. Though, again, different states had different arrangements. Six states, as I already said, paid churches out of the public treasury in 1787 when the U.S. Constitution was drafted. A seventh, Georgia, had a constitutional provision to do so that apparently they never acted upon. The great majority of states limited civil rights to Protestants, to Christians, or to theists. Some required office holders to swear their belief in God and a future state of rewards and punishments. Others went so far as to limit office holding to Christians or to Protestants. Some declined to enfranchise Jews, Unitarians, or Protestants, or, or agnostics. Several provided for religious freedom only with a specific caveat that was often anti-Catholic once you got beneath it, uh, that a person's religious liberty could not, quote, justify practices inconsistent with the peace or safety of the state and that religious liberty could not be used to excuse acts of licentiousness, which they never defined. But even these arrangements were not stable. In 1789, Georgia removed all limits to civil and political protection based on religious belief. The next year, South Carolina followed, but then it added that the freedom of conscience provided by state constitutions, by the state constitution, did not excuse acts of licentiousness. Again, we have that language. Excuse acts of licentiousness or justify practices inconsistent with the peace or safety of this state. 
The same year, Pennsylvania dropped its Christian oath of office and theoretically extended equal protection to non-believers. But it still required all office holders to, to acknowledge the being of a god and a future state of rewards and punishments. 1792, Delaware dropped its oath of office that required the belief in the Trinity, uh, but it added language to its freedom of conscience clause that said the following. It is the duty of all men frequently to assemble together for the public worship of the author of the universe, because such worship promotes the piety and morality on which the prosperity of communities depend. Other states, starting in 1793 with Vermont, began to drop their institutional arrangements to pay Christian churches out of the public treasury. These state-level arguments or arrangements bring us to a fifth fallacy. And, and that fallacy is the inordinate and improper focus on the First Amendment to the US Constitution as having a determining influence on the role of religion in American public life. When the Constitution was passed, many critics complained of the godlessness of the Constitution. And there is, of course, no reference to God in the US Constitution except for the passing reference to the year of our Lord in, I think, Article 7. But the fact of the matter is, is, that, when the, that, is that the federal Constitution didn't really matter when it came to religion. There had never been a single religious arrangement that governed all the colonies. There had never been a single religious arrangement that governed all the states. And uh, uh, that continued under the US Constitution. That was something that some founding fathers were disturbed by, in particular, James Madison. James Madison had agreed with Thomas Jefferson in his separationist desire to separate church and state. He didn't get that, though, consistently throughout the US constitutional process. During the Constitutional Convention, he actually wanted a national government that could veto state laws, in particular because he worried that states were part of the leading edge of religious discrimination. He didn't get that. When he began to draft the First Amendment, he, just, he, he tried to install his religious vision or his separationist vision through the amendment process. He failed there as well. Instead, what happened was Madison's amendments kept getting wh whittled down, and the, revolting, the resulting, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting slip right there. Um, <laughs> the resulting provision was so vague and meaningless that it's really hard to know what to make of it. You, you may know that the First Amendment starts, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now the obvious question is, what does that mean? And the obvious answer is, I have no idea. Because the problem with that First Amendment is that it is self-referentially incoherent. You have to define religion in order to protect it. And in defining one aspect of religion or one definition of religion, you could be said to be establishing it. And moreover, the only thing clear about that amendment is that what it prohibits is action by Congress. But, state, but religion was always regulated on a state level, not a national level. That, in any case, seems to be how Chief Justice John Marshall interpreted it in 1833 in Barron v. Baltimore, when he ruled that only a particular state's constitution, quote, provided such limitations and restrictions on the power of its particular government as its judgment dictated. Trying to attach any more meaning uh, to the First Amendment, other than just a limitation on Congress interfering with states doing whatever they wish, runs up against what the religious historian Sidney Mead has described as the amendment's laconic brevity and consequent vagueness. It just doesn't seem to have any kind of inherent meaning. Now, I suppose it's possible to take this fact as an indication of the ultimate agreement of the founding generation. It's not a substantive agreement, but a procedural one that basically allows the states to do whatever they wish. This approach would take the issue of the founders' understanding of uh, religion and politics or religious freedom, and it dissolves that issue into another issue, which is the issue of federalism. And there is something to be said for that argument, though it does pretty well disregard the desires of Madison and Jefferson and others. But still, if there is an agreement between the founding generation, some kind of bare bones majoritarian consensus, it is that the relationship of religion and the state is one that ought to be decided on the state, not on the federal level. But finally, I want to point out one more fallacy that underwrites this entire discussion. And that fallacy is the presumption that in talking about the founding fathers and religious freedom, we often tend to assume that the political thought of the founding generation is somehow binding on all subsequent generations. 
That strike me, strikes me as an error for a number of reasons. And although I don't have time here to go over the entire originalism controversy, or to explain entirely why originalism is wrong, I'll simply note that although the First Amendment did not apply to the states when it was originally enacted, it does so now. And the reason for that, of course, is the constitutional revolution of the American Civil War. The reverence that people have for the American Founding Fathers seems to me to be singularly misplaced on precisely this point. In a constitutional democracy, citizens are supposed to solve their disagreements by voting. But in a fundamental sense, during the Civil War, the Founding Fathers failed as founders. The Civil War involved Americans killing Americans on a spectacular scale, and the Founders left little guidance on what to do about it. One observer admitted in 1866, and he was not a radical, this is all a direct quote, for the control of the rebellious states, the Fathers left no rules. For the conduct of our treasury and civil war, they laid down no system of finance. For diplomatic dealings with foreign powers, while our government was threatened with disruption, they provided no precedent. The foundation, ultimately, of the Union came apart in the Civil War, and those foundations had to be relayed accordingly. During Reconstruction, radical Republicans remade the American constitutional arrangement that would have profound effect on the understanding of rights and how they were protected on the federal level. The 13th Amendment, for example, abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment nationalized citizenship, and it's that 14th Amendment through which the protection of rights moved to the federal level from the states. The 15th Amendment gave all men the right to vote. And the total effect of this was a profound renovation of American government, a revolution of national purposes and of constitutional design, not simply a restoration of the Father's Union. I worry, though, that to speak of the Founders' vision of religion and religious freedom assumes that the chasm of the Civil War can be crossed, that we can return to some primeval moment of national creation. I worry that it denies time and political and constitutional development. I worry that it asserts, as Ulysses S. Grant complained, that the people of one generation can lay down the best and only rules of government for all who are to come after them. It is, to me, a generational tyranny that doesn't make sense, and it is, in fact, belied by the constitutional development after the Civil War. So I suppose on this issue, I stand with Lincoln. Although he spent the better part of his efforts prior to the Civil War trying to show that the Founding Fathers agreed with him, he recognized the problems inherent in that debate. And in his Cooper Union Address, though he went to great lengths to show that, that the Founding Fathers were these group of people and however you define them, they agreed with him, he also took a step back and assured his audience with the following words. I do not mean to say, as he's saying it in fact, but I do not mean to say that we are bound to follow implicitly in whatever our, founding fa whatever our fathers did. To do so would be to discard all the lights of current experience to reject all progress, all improvement. That, I fear, is ultimately what this discussion risks. It takes a deeply illiberal era, and the founding era was a deeply illiberal era, one in which the insane could be tied to a post and left for much of his or her life, one in which an extermination order could be placed on Muslims, or on uh, Mormons, one in which uh, Muslims were an exoticized novelty associated locally with the Ottoman Empire, one in which atheism could be casually assumed to be an intellectual, moral, and social outrage. In other words, it takes an era utterly unlike our own and makes it binding on the present. That disregard for time, for circumstance, and at least to my mind, for sense, seems to me the gravest fallacy of all. Thank you so much. So I guess we're taking questions. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much for these talks. Um, I'm thinking about the case of um, free African Americans. And with an understanding that um, until the Civil War and Reconstruction's revolution, um, the religious liberty of free African Americans is widely um, and capaciously um, uh, interfered with um, by the individual states. 
So I can't figure out which way that cuts when I listen to these two presentations. Um, on the one hand, perhaps it cuts to um, undermine the notion that there was ever a golden age of religious liberty because we would recognize that there was always regulation. And then on the other hand, I wonder if that isn't, in a sense, a point of consensus among the founders, that whatever else religious liberty might mean, um, it certainly does not mean that people of African descent, um, that that right extends to people of African descent. Discuss. Go. Thanks. I mean, I'm not sure I really fully understand your question. I mean, there, you have to make a distinction between the founders' political thought and their political practice. Right? I mean, the founders did all sorts of things inconsistent with their principles. I mean, that's easy to show. And then the question is, well, what's the true founding? Is it their practice uh, or is it their principles? Well, I, I guess then I would extend the analysis of their principles to not simply the text of the constitutions that you provided us, but to the, then the text of the state laws that interfere with the free exercise of religion by African Americans. Those seem to me to yeah, be yeah. So those companion texts. Those state laws would reflect certain practices that are inconsistent with the principles they that they ideas. lay out. They reflect ideas. They reflect pol political no, no, philosophy. No, I, I and yes, they may manifest in practice, but, they re but no more so, no less so, than the text of the constitutions do they reflect only practice. Mm -hmm. well, let me, what, if you look at the state constitutions, since you direct us to the state constitutions, and if you read them carefully, you will see when they talk about religious liberty, they use terms like no person, no individual, right? Not no Christian and not no, no citizen. So there are certain rights that are recognized as belonging to all individuals as such, and then there are certain rights that only are recognized as belonging to citizens, right? Because, I mean, there, there are these really fundamental distinctions that we, we, I mean, we think we're so smart, but we don't even, I mean, we can't even understand these texts because we've, uh, we don't understand basic political concepts. The distinction between natural rights and political rights, natural rights and civil rights, that's a fundamental distinction, right? When they write about natural rights, they write very precisely, and they say, they use the language, no individuals can be deprived of their free exercise of the religion. Did they live up to those principles in practice? Uh, well, well, no, obviously not, and not only in religion, right? So, I, I mean, I'm not sure if we disagree. I mean, if you say they didn't have a principled commitment to natural rights, well, then I just think we disagree. I mean, they clearly did, right? Did they live up to those principles? No, but clearly they did not. So, um we, we disagree, for sure. And I, I would say that we disagree insofar as I, I think that you are lifting one strand of thought and making that stand for the whole. And I agree entirely that there are ideas embodied in the laws. There are actually ideas embodied in the constitutions. There's a, these early constitutions often have a declaration of rights, and then they're followed by the constitution itself. And sometimes the, the declaration of rights is the, it's usually the first part of the constitution, but then it's elaborated out. And, and what you see when you look at these constitutions, these early texts, is that a right can be broadly declared in the declaration of rights, and then systematically violated in the actual text of the constitution itself, and then further violated violated once the laws actually get put in place after the Constitution is drafted, all of which suggests a kind of lived ideas, a lived reality that, that would suggest, to, well, what, what are they doing when they're, when they're affirming this, this particular capacious right? And what I would say they're doing is they're, they're affirming a particular kind of white Protestantism very often that excludes certainly the free blacks, that excludes Native Americans. Like they, they're often, if you can go back and look at uh, early discussion about Native American religion and, and it doesn't it's not even acknowledged as religion, it's acknowledged as superstition. And so I would say that yes, it does cut against the idea that there is some golden age of religious freedom. That if you want to justify religious freedom, that you should not be looking at the 1780s or the 1790s or whenever. And that the flowering of religious freedom comes with the emergence of religious pluralism in the 20th century. And that if there is a golden age of religious freedom, it is right now. <laughs>
Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm hoping you can both speak a little more to the Hobby Lobby, the recent Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case, and the way that that has changed the world that we live in, a world in which closely held corporations now are able to have religions and therefore have rights to religious liberty and how that you know impacts the employees of those closely held corporations. So to Professor Munoz, I'd just be curious to hear what you think in terms of um, is that Supreme Court decision consistent with the Constitution? And then I'd also be interested to hear what your opinion is of that Supreme Court case and what some of the repercussions might be. Sure, it's a nice question. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in corporate law, so, but it's not clear to me that much changed because I think corporations were understood to have First Amendment rights long before Hobby Lobby. So I would, I think I would push back on your assumption that things have changed. Now, whether that's good or bad is a different question. I don't actually think it much has changed, right? I mean, you can go back to what uh, John Marshall says about corporations. I think it's the Dartmouth case. And basically, uh, um, I think it's 1819 or I could, 1816 or something, 1823, and you know, corporations are fictitious people that they, but they have the rights of people. I mean, that's a, a long and old story. So now, whether we think that's good or bad, again, is a different question. Uh, so Hobby Lobby is adjudicated under federal law, right? A, a law that could be changed tomorrow if Congress had the will, will to do it. So it's not, it's not really a constitutional question. I mean, there might be other constitutional questions, but that whole case was under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the one. Uh, and, and mind you, I mean, it was um, a fellow named Bill Galston. I don't know if that name means anything to you. Uh, he was sort of Clinton's, uh, he was the House intellectual in the Clinton White House. That's how he describes himself, right? A man of the left. And he was just speaking at Notre Dame. And he, one of the things he, he said very publicly was like, the signature achievement of the Clinton administration, in his view, and one of the things Bill Clinton was most proud of was passing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, right? And that, an act that his wife, I think, repudiates today. So if you really wanna see a change, it's the change that's happened in the Democratic Party. Uh, so again, we disagree. Uh, I think Hobby Lobby is actually a very important and very significant departure and a very disturbing one. And to, the way to understand it is to understand the emergence of religious freedom and its connection to the religious right. And uh, the, the entire idea of religious freedom was a kind of under litigated um, uh, uh, thing. You, you didn't see a whole lot of, of uh, opinions on religious freedom. And then in uh, 1990, there was a decision, uh, the Smith decision, uh, that was actually penned by um, the late Justice Scalia. And it involved a group of Native Americans in Oregon who ingested peyote. And they were government employees, and that's a, a controlled, I guess maybe even forbidden substance, and so they were fired. And Justice Scalia, in a departure of what was the ruling um, jurisprudence up to that point, said that the state need not provide accommodations. That it could, but it need not, and it lowered the whole bar of, of review. And so the, the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act was the response, the congressional response to that, that sought to bring it back to the pre-Smith jurisprudence. And if you go back and you talk to people, and this is, this is an, or, an originalist move that I'm aware that I'm about to make, if you go back to, the talk, to talk to the, um, the people who drafted that, or you simply read the text, they're very clear that they're trying to reinstall the jurisprudence pre-1990 and pre the Smith decision. But what happened was over the next decade or two decades, as the encroaching secular state began to be felt, and in particular as Obamacare began to uh, be unfurled and all these laws began, or even these legal challenges came up, what the people who were leading those, those challenges realized was that RIFRA uh, provided a, a very useful weapon not a defense, but a weapon. And uh, Hobby Lobby represents, I think, a, a two or three decade extended attempt by uh, the religious right to carve out larger and larger swaths of American society for which neutral law no longer applies. And if you really think about what this means, that means uh, some corporation like Mars, uh, which is a closely held corporation that has something like 90,000 employees, can on the whims of its three or four uh, uh, family members decide, make essentially religious and personal choices for its employees. That is a significant uh, move away. And I don't believe up before the Hobby Lobby decision that 
there was the recognition, even though corporations were people and they had First Amendment rights, they did not have First Amendment religious freedom rights. And this religious freedom um, kind of move excludes daycare centers, it excludes uh, uh, churches from zoning regulations, it excludes uh, anything that can be construed as broadly religious from employment regulations. And so we're getting to the point now where you have an, a kind of an alternative universe of religious regulation where otherwise applicable laws simply are not relevant. And I find that personally deeply disturbing. I have to add one point. So I, we agree on the deeply disturbing part. I'm sort of on your, on your side with that. But you've got to at least recognize the irony of what you're saying, right? Because what, you, what you're ascribing to the religious right is, I mean, it's in one way true that the religious right uses. Uh, but this, the person who's most responsible for these exemptions that you deplore and who justified it theoretically by saying, government is going to be doing more and more, and therefore we need to carve out larger space for exemptions. It's William Brennan, the greatest progressive of the second half of the 20th century, and he did it under the philosophy of living constitutionalism, which is the alternative that you reject. This is living, this is your approach. The, and you don't like the results of the very thing that you're calling for judges to do. This is all liberal jurisprudence, right? Right? Scalia is the conservative, right? That's why he overturns it, right? I mean, you at least have to see the irony. This is, the create, this is what you're calling for judges to do. Oh, I will, I will fully admit that I have come to see that um, the Smith decision was a very good decision in some ways, precisely do you, do you because... That, do you believe that? I'm going to ask a point of question. Do you believe that because of your philosophy of jurisprudence, or do you believe that for simply partisan reasons? I... Neither, some, some, or maybe both, or maybe somewhere in between. But uh, uh, and not, I would say, for, for partisan reasons, but it does seem to me, and I wouldn't root this in a philosophy of jurisprudence, um, and I have none, so you know, that, that helps. Um, That's liberal jurisprudence. That's the very point. I, I would say it's because uh, the difficulty of carving out exemptions in a pluralistic nation becomes, it involves you in, in, in endless problems. And I see now that what Scalia was trying to do was cut through that difficulty. Now the problem was in that decision, he, he said in essence that uh, this will burden religious minorities, but that's fine. And uh, many people at the time were thinking religious minorities meaning Native Americans. And it's only been in, in the last, over the last 20 years or so, suddenly people are realizing actually that might mean conservative white evangelicals. And that's where that I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna, that read, I'm gonna translate problem. what I hear All you right. saying. What I hear you saying is w when we design this liberal jurisprudence, we assume liberals would be the one running the court. And therefore we liked it. But we can't defend it in principle. Well, it's good when we have the judges. It's bad when other people have the judges. Officially, we as in me didn't design anything. Uh, but I would say that liberal jurisprudence has been fundamentally compromised since the beginning of the early rulings on, uh, on religion, starting in 1940 and 1947 in Cantwell. It, there, you can't extract a coherent principle of jurisprudence there. Liberal and conservative, not. The entire jurisprudence, the entire body of jurisprudence is a complete mess. And we can um, probably disagree on why it's a mess. You would say it's a mess because it's ad hoc and it's, it's a, an, an extension of living constitutionalism. I would say it's a mess because they didn't actually take seriously the program of separating church and state. But either way, we agree that it's a mess. You'll notice Dave and I have these deep, deep agreements, actually. It's true, And yeah. deep disagreements at the same time, yeah. which is why it's so yeah. fun for us to be together, yeah. Uh, hi, could you return to that question or the issue you raised about, uh, uh, it says no establishment of religion by the state or no prohibition of religion by the state, but it's a self-defeating uh, principle mm -hmm. because the state has to define what they mean by yeah. religion and in doing that they yeah. uh, de facto establish religion. Is there any way to avoid that? I don't think so. I mean, what, you know, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine and he said, we, we need to be like the Romans. You know, if you, if you are a recognized religion of the state before, you know, this period of time, then you're a religion and otherwise you're not. But otherwise, I don't see how you get around it. I mean, we live in a massively pluralistic society and uh, the, even the conception of religion 
has or is laden with religious ideas, you know? And so like the court's definition that he flashed up, it's very clear the court's definition is a Protestant definition of religion. It assumes sincerely held belief. But if you talk to many Jews, for example, I mean, belief isn't that big of a deal in some parts of, of the conservative Jewish tradition, you know? It's about practice or it's about ritual or it's about something else. So this focus on belief itself, even in the court's current jurisprudential standard is a Protestant definition. And I just don't see how there is any way around the definition of religion and that definition thereby de facto establishing that definition. I'm glad you touched on that because I think the a difference is between the religious um, regulation and this religious freedom. Hobby Lobby was brought up. That's just an example. But what I see what's coming is a real fight against a pluralistic society. Because in, um, and you probably know this well, um, 500 years ago was the, um, what was the Protestant Reformation, duh, 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 you know. And uh, much of our courts is by white Protestant um, theologians, believers, whatever you call them. And I think as a pluralistic society, we need to look at those that are not of that hierarchy. That's the Jews, that's the Muslims, that's the whatever other religions. And it's interesting to me, and I like this because this is where things are. This is what rises up with conflicts in this whole religious issue. I'm just gonna stop one second. I talked to a friend today that comes from a, a very Protestant background. She has a son who's gay. She has a nephew, I'll get teary-eyed, who was also proclaimed as being gay, went to his Protestant church, told them approximately a little over eight years ago, I'm gay. You know what the pastor said? You can't join the church. When you talk, he took his life. Now this is issues. You can talk about Hobby Lobby, you can say anything you want, but the core of it is, what are we doing as humans to, to our, our, the, the people that are walking beside us? What are we doing? What are we, what are, what are we get? I look at what's, and Trump just did something about, what did he do today? Something signing something about, religion and politics or some sort uh, of thing? He, he eased the rules that religious institutions can there you or go. could not make political pronouncements, and now they can. And it's coming up again. I believe we are, as a country, we are black backsliding to where the Puritans were. They came in pure, and they had to get rid of those that didn't look like them or act like them. How do you think law should respond to that? I'm just curious. Um, I think the law should look at the individual right, and you cannot bring religion into the Constitution. You cannot bring in, as far as barring um, Hobby Lobby, to me, has no place in saying um, we will pay for we will pay for the um, insurance, but not if you da 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 da. No. That's not religious freedom. That's not the Constitution. Who's going to stand up for the independence, the liberty in a culture we live? I don't know. I'm asking you guys. You're the experts. Well, just, let me just, so I agree with you, actually, like, more than you probably presume. But I just, Hobby Lobby thinks that's what they're doing. I mean, at least we should recognize that, right? That's fine. So here's but my, here's my, uh, I think you will not like this, but here's my, um, so your underlying premise, the very first thing you said, which I thought you said very nicely, is this increasing pluralism and yeah. diversity, and, and not only just in religious diversity and ethnic diversity and economic diversity, but uh, the deep divisions and ideological diversity. I mean, we really just are so polarized as a country. And so how are we gonna get along? It seems to me there are two basic options, right? We, we club each other and one side wins and the other side loses. That's gonna be really painful. Um, or we think about, well, what's the most dangerous force in society? And here's where we'll disagree. I actually think what American history teaches us is, is um, 
those who wield the power of the state can do the greatest damage to people, right? I mean, who has harmed African Americans most in this country's history? It's the state. And the more we can depoliticize society, right, the more we can depoliticize our society and remove these questions of, from politics, right, the, the more we'll be able to get, get along. That means politics can't do a lot of things we want it to do. But I think that's a consequence of a pluralistic society. And I, I mean, to me, I mean, someone like Donald Trump just reaffirms that, right? I, I, I would like when the president, uh, become, any president, but especially when a president like Trump is elected, to not be so fearful because that president has less power. Um, so I would just point out briefly that uh, no one has protected African Americans in the United States more than the federal government. And that the federal government is and has long been the guarantor of rights, not just for African Americans, but for many others. And the idea that you're going to remove state power and somehow keep rights seems to me to be deeply flawed. I would say that um, I wrote my first book was on this question of religious freedom. And I read the entire corpus of Supreme Court cases on religious freedom and on the Establishment Clause. And one of the most interesting cases that I read was um, from the 1940s in the middle of, the, of World War II. And I believe it was the Gobitis decision. I, I'm kind of struggling to call up that decision at the moment. But it was a compulsory, uh, a compulsory um, uh, uh, pledge, you know, flag salute kind of case that the Jehovah's, the Jehovah's Witnesses objected to. And the court, in a series of, of uh, moving opinions, that was kind of one of several, articulated what I thought was a very powerful vision of law. And it was a vision of law in which the goal was to create a body of law that could apply to people regardless of their religious ideas, that was capacious enough that many different types of people could live under, and that really recognized the diversity that existed in the United States. And the distinction that I would make is diversity just is. You, you, you just is. Like there's not, you're not going to go away and it's only going to be more. But a turn toward a pluralistic vision of law, which both embraces diversity and tries to create a legal and political apparatus that either celebrates diversity or accommodates diversity or it somehow encourages that diversity, that, that that is the goal. And the problem that I see with the current march of Supreme Court cases is that they take on the name of diversity and that they carve out these exceptions to generally applicable law, but they seem to be geared toward creating places of discrimination, and I think that's problematic. Barnett is the case. Barnett, Barnett is it. the case, yeah. yeah. Hey, hey uh, you all are sharp as a stick. I had a chance to uh, speak with you uh, over the break uh, with Professor Munoz and uh, Professor Sahat, incredibly intelligent. And so I feel so embarrassed being up here. I, you know, uh, I got a dumb question. Uh, before I do that, though, it, uh, to the point that you made about who harmed African Americans the most and, and the argument that the state did, I would argue uh, that maybe you're right, but it would be the state and the people whom the state represented that 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 empowered. Well, I, I would say that there, it was it was a pylon, uh, is what I would say. Uh, and so, the dumb question that I have, and I, I told you, I'm kind of embarrassed being up here asking, uh, but if I if I were buying what you said earlier about the government should be in no business or the business of religion at all, then I'm wondering why, why doesn't the government tax all religious institutions then and in not recognizing them as being special or, or, or anything? Yeah, is no, that, I, a, I know no, it's, it's a great, I think it's a great question. And um, uh, so there's two ways, there, there is a way that you could extend uh, under these natural <clears throat> principles uh, I articulated, there is a way you could effectively uh, make religions tax exempt, and that would be um, uh, you would have a tax exempt category not based on religious affiliation, right? So you just, if you're an edu educational or charitable or organization, you get tax exempt, and then a religion might class uh, qualify not as a religion, but as this other category. 
That would be, I think, constitutionally fine, not, not problematic. But let me push the argument, uh, the spirit of your argument, which is why should anyone get a tax exemption? Churches or not. I mean, I pay more taxes than the University of Notre Dame. University of Notre Dame, more property taxes. University of Notre Dame has an $11 billion endowment. Trust me, I do not have $11 billion, <laughs> right? So why should anyone get a tax exemption, right? Now, the response from churches you'll hear as well, you know, how is the Roman Catholic Church going to afford Saint, the property taxes on St. Patrick's Cathedral? You know, oh, that's a good point. Uh, how does anyone afford property taxes in New York, that's a, right? When's the last time you've heard a sermon on excessive taxation? And why haven't you heard such a sermon? And what has the tax exemption of churches done to our politics? Has it helped preserve liberty or harmed it? And I think you have to think through those questions very, very seriously. And would there be more liberty and equality if we had no tax exemptions for anyone, including churches? Are the uh, decisions, uh, are the uh, religious beliefs of the members of the Supreme Court influencing decisions? And if so, what do you think, though, how that's going? This is a topic that political scientists study a lot. They look at the, the personal characteristics, sort of psychological characteristics of uh, Supreme Court justice. It's not my area of study, so I hesitate. I hesitate to say anything. I mean, there was, just to tie in our earlier question, uh, maybe somewhat ironically, you know, there was no Protestants on the Supreme Court for a long time, right? It's, uh, Neil Gorsuch now has the Protestant seat, one seat. Maybe we can agree on that, just one seat <laughs> for Protestants. Um, so uh, I think the, the scholars that have looked at judicial behavior of this tend to see, again, I'm just summarizing what I understand other people to be finding, that it's not so much psychological characteristics but really political orientation that is most influential. But I, do you know much about this? Um, no, I think that's right. I mean, there, so there's, there's, let's see if we can add this up. There's uh, three Jews, I believe, right? There's uh, five Catholics and there's one Protestant. And the uh, four of the Catholics are conservative. Uh, three of the Jews are liberal. Uh, one of the, um, the one Protestant presumably is conservative. That's Neil Gorsuch. And then one Catholic is uh, liberal. And, um, you know, it seems like a more reliable indicator of uh, judicial uh, philosophy or of voting patterns to look not at their um, religious persuasion, um, but to look at who appointed them. Comment and a question. The comment you were talking about harming what group tends to harm African Americans, the state, I almost want to say the plural is more the states plural as opposed to state singular, because oftentimes the idea of states' rights, which is in, itself, in and of itself not a bad idea, ended up used as a weapon sure. yeah. against Agree 100%. African Americans. For where I ended up that used that way, and so the federal government has tended to step in. And a little more on that. But a question, you brought, David, you brought this up as far as the role of the 14th Amendment and how the effect of the 14th Amendment versus kind of in a way rewrote the relationship between the federal and the states. The question is, do you balance the two? Do you look at the founders versus what was the intent of the writers of the 14th Amendment on freedom of speech, on freedom of religion? Did they, did they look at that? It's the, how do you look at this, in what later revelation, if I may use a kind of a biblical concept here, later revelation do you have from this group to compare Back to that, do you balance the two, or do you throw your, or are you saying just throw your hands up and ignore both of them and do what we feel like? I mean, where do you? 
I wouldn't know what it would mean to balance the two. It seems to me, though, I mean, it's just a simple fact that if you ask somebody, you know, what, 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 where is your citizenship? What are you a citizen of? You would have said in 1850, I'm a citizen of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And if I said, well, what about the United States? That, that would have just been a meaningless concept to yeah. you. But after the 14th Amendment, which declared this right of national citizenship, there's a change in language that you never, you, did, you didn't hear anymore, the United States are. You heard the United States is. So that's, that's okay. basically the revolution of the 14th Amendment rendered linguistically. Uh, and you would have said, well, what is your citizenship? And your, the answer is, I'm a citizen of the United States and of Michigan. And because you have dual citizenship on the federal level. And so in one sense, the way to understand the 14th Amendment is that it pre preserved federalism, but that it declared this right of citizenship. But then once that right is declared, then suddenly cases are brought before the court. Mm -hmm. And the court has to decide, well, is this a right of citizenship or is that? Well, where does the right of citizenship, wh what are these rights? And what the court eventually decided was, well, it seems kind of obvious that many of those rights of citizenship are laid out in the Bill of Rights. And so the court, on a piecemeal basis, began to what is called incorporate that part of the amendment through the 14th Amendment. Okay. And again, that's part of just the development of constitutional law. And I don't know what it would mean to balance the founder's vision versus and, and the I'm grasping at the 14th. Uh, balancing, I'm grasping at a term. I think I want to say is, what are the roles of the two groups? David's exactly, David's exactly right. <laughs> There's an interesting, you're getting at something though, and balancing is not actually such a bad term because in, um, there's a case right now before the Supreme Court, which is gonna, um, it's a difficult one for, for people like us to think through. So many states have what are known as uh, Blaine Amendments, mm -hmm. right? And these, um, these uh, they, they vary from state to state. Uh, they say something like, uh, no public funds should go to any sectarian institution, right? And those are in state constitutions. I don't know, do you know when they start? 1850s or 1860s? Uh, no, they're, they're from the 1880s. 1880s are a little yeah. bit later? Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm from in the state of Washington, and Washington has one. Yeah, in, in, in response to Catholicism, yeah. basically. Yeah, and they're clearly, I, I think this is not controversial, they were clearly anti-Catholic and, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I mean, what are sectarian institutions? That's Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. the Protestants weren't. And so these are in the state constitutions, uh, uh, arguably compatible with the 14th Amendment, but perhaps incompatible with the First Amendment. Right? or maybe incompatible with a different part of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause. And so balancing might not be the right term, but you're on to something. What, what, how, if you have these competing uh, uh, principles or constitutional texts, let's put it that way. You have or these competing not necessarily texts. competing, how are they competing and how are they complementary? Yeah, and so here's my answer to this question, right? So the reason I go back to the founders, and I said this, it's not because they wrote the Constitution, not the standard originalist ones, right? The only real reason to go to the founders or to the authors of the 14th Amendment, or to William Brennan for that matter, is because they articulate principles of justice that are persuasive, right? That's why we should follow anyone. And that means we have to rigorously analyze these principles, right? My interest in the founders is not because they were founders, <coughs> I mean, that helps, but it's because they articulate principles of natural rights, which I think have done uh, great good when they've been followed and great harm when they've been ignored. And if the authors of the 14th Amendment or William Brennan or some future Supreme Court justice who's not there can articulate better principles or articulate the same principles in a, more, a deeper or more profound way, then we should follow that person. I'm getting uh, the signal that we're done here. So thank you so much.